Recently, I had the pleasure of talking to Remy Van Tripp, head of the Language Research Unit at the Sony Computer Science Laboratories in Paris. He is one of the principal developers of Fluid Construction Grammar, and his team is trying to answer some of the most profound questions in linguistics, using techniques from computational linguistics, artificial intelligence, and robotics. It's complex and very technical work, but as you'll see in this interview, Remy has an incredible ability to explain complex things in an easy to understand way. This is an edited version of our interview. If you would like to listen to the full version, you'll find a link down in the description box where you will also find a link to Remy's website. I hope you enjoy it. Remy Van Trape, thank you very much for talking to me today. Thank you for having me. For a lot of people out there, so this, this could be um, uh, students and, and even teachers and maybe even people who are you know, really interested in language, when they think of grammar, they think of something like this, like an Oxford, you know, modern grammar or, or, or some other type of grammar. But maybe what people don't realize is that there's not just one way to describe language, right? There's not just the sort of the, the dictionary plus grammar kind of method. There's also alternatives like, for example, construction grammar. Now, could, could you just sort of explain like what construction grammar is and, and how it's different from, from other types of, well, from more traditional grammar? Right. So uh, traditional grammar, let's, let's say you, you can have a, you can bake a cake with different layers, right? And a traditional grammar is like you have one layer which you eat horizontally. You eat one layer of phonology, you eat one layer of morphology, and then you eat syntax. And so step by step by step. And in language technologies, likewise, you have like a pipeline of different steps. Now, a construction grammarian doesn't eat horizontally, eats vertically like you're supposed to eat the cake, right? You, you put one scoop in it and you eat everything at the same time. So construction is about everything we know, all our knowledge about language is represented in the same way. So a word and a grammatical structure or a syntactic structure are not fundamentally different. They're the same. So you have this one way of, of representing everything. And a very good quote from the linguist Bill Croft is like, you know, we linguists, we, we always try to make it neat and clean, but when you actually look at how languages work, it's never neat and clean. So you, you, you kind of, when you want to describe a language or describe how people use language, you always need to access all these different kinds of information at the same time. And a construction grammar allows you to do that in, in, in a very flexible, uh, simple way. What exactly is defined as, as a construction? Like if I make, is a construction the same thing as a clause? Is it a sentence? You know, what, what is a construction? Uh, the vanilla definition is just a construction. It's any convention that associates some form of meaning or use or uh, intentions together with uh, the form of it. And so the, the most simple construction you can think of is just a word, right? A cup, cup is the form, and then you know what object you mean. But if you have a more elaborate grammatical construction, like um, you say, uh, uh, he gave me a book, right? So that whole clause, the ditransitive clause, has a typical meaning associated with it, like the transfer of some object um, in, in various ways. So it's always this coupling of function, meaning, um, intentions, and also social considerations. So what, um, you know, uh, say, using in French the polite to against vous, you know, knowing all these things combined with some form. So in a sense, everything is a construction. It's constructions all the way down. Um, and it's just learning those. I mean, th th this, is, this is a question that I've actually asked to a lot of different people, which is, um, you know, clearly input is really important. And I've spoken to so many people, including polyglots, and they they always seem to emphasize the importance of input, you know, input, input, input. But it obviously can't be only input because there are so many people who have lots of, you know, passive vocabulary and passive grammar, but they can't, 
you know, have a conversation. So, so something interesting to me about your, your kind of process is, is about actually putting yourself in that social situation and communicating, right? Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah. Input. I mean, um, when, when we use language, let's say you're con- trying to comprehend something and it's in another language, I mean, it's not the language that solves your problems. The language is just your, your tool to get to the meaning, right? And we're, as humans, when we're communicating, we use everything we can. So, so the linguistic uh, input is just one thing. We, we look at, at cues, at, at past experiences. So it's, it's our whole cognitive process. It's the language user that is intelligent. It's not the linguistic system. And so when you, when you go to a foreign country, you don't know the language you still understand a lot because you have experienced interactions with humans before and there are basic experiences. So you, you can get by with a lot. And then, as, as you say, when you try talking yourself or when you, you have to write a letter or, you know, if you're speaking, as, speaking if you're signing in a sign language, then, then you get stuck because you, you, don't, you don't have these habits yet. And the, let's say the production part is then more difficult. In the production part, you have to come up with something that, to make yourself understood by the by the other uh, speech participant, and that's a, a much harder question. Which is why in our work we always try to to do both ways. We we don't do just comprehension. We also try and model the uh, production part of language. And and well, I, I know I, I have some examples of of your work here, um, and you know some of it's really you know super interesting. But um, before we sort of talk about that. Like I'm curious about, um, you know, when when you're modeling input and output in in these systems, you know, what what's the kind of ideal balance? Is there, you know, what what, what does your modeling tell us about language learning? Well, it it really depends on the research question you're asking, uh, because because a model is always just like any experiment is is some kind of abstraction or a simplification of a of a particular problem. So. When I do an experiment and I start, for example, with a population of artificial language users, and they can start, for example, without any grammar, without any vocabulary, even without any concepts, and then uh, you know, their learning task will be very different than from if I start a simulation with already some grammar for, for example, German, which, which I also did. Um, it, the, the method is always the same. You, if the hardest part of these experiments is, is coming up with an interaction, a situated communicative context in which the language makes sense. Why would you use that in a certain uh, context? And then we figure out, well, there is a functional part, which is you know, what you're trying to say, but then there is also the cognitive part is like, what are the computational limitations that our brains uh, put on the table? Um, to make to make the discussion a bit more concrete, so I I personally had a very bad experience with learning German when I was still in school, and this was mainly due to a teacher who uh, who I didn't like or who didn't like me, and so I had a very awkward relationship with German, and then you know went to study Germanic linguistics, nevertheless. So at some point, um, one thing that I struggled with was always this this case system of German, which seems like an arbitrary mess of, of different forms. And um, you have somebody like Mark Twain having written about that awful German. So I felt like, yes, you know, uh, it's not my fault. I wasn't a bad learner. It's the language. But then, you know, there's, I, I do believe, this my strong conviction is that languages are adapted to communication. It's, it's, I think it's the, most magnificent invention that people have ever come up with. It's, you know, solving this problem of, of communication. And so I, I couldn't stand it that German would be like a counterexample to my belief. And I started implementing a grammar of German. And then this is something that most linguists don't engage in. Most linguists will try and write down what, what you need to know, you know, like, like as if there is some passive rule list uh, and then the problem of how to use it and how to process these things, that's something else. And as a computational linguist, we don't have that luxury. We have to build processing models. And then when I started working on German and started to figure out like how 
could I process these difficult case uh, ambiguities? Turned out that in, in most of the uh, situations, it's like the cues were just good enough that if you put them all together, the ambiguities would disappear, or at least the structural ambiguities. And then I, I discovered that that German has this wonderful way of if you have a noun phrase and you have an article, an adjective, a noun, they carry the burden of who expresses which information. And it, it's very dynamical. It's a very beautiful system. It's, so these things I, I discover, and it's, it's a pleasure of doing this. It's like, wow, this works really wonderful. It, it's a wonderful solution to a very complex problem. And, and for example, if you, if you took a model and in your model, these, these artificial students, imagine they had 5,000 words of vocabulary and they had some basic grammar, what would then, what would then sort of really help those, these artificial learners to, 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 to move towards fluent communication? Um. <laughs> Have you ever modeled that? Or <laughs> <laughs> And if you haven't, can you please model it? <laughs> uh, it's, it's a difficult question. What is fluent communication? Well, um, maybe I should say uh, successful communication. The real difficulty, as I said before, is coming up with the, uh, the interaction. Like we call them language games, but it's a situated communicative interaction. And there is part of it which is kind of conventionalized. It's like when you meet somebody, uh, the greetings you do. And so for these kinds of interactions, they become very successful. Uh, just by interacting and you you provide them you provide them with learning mechanisms so um, a learner might might have misheard something or there's a word in the input that they didn't know uh, or they might fail miserably at an interaction that happens a lot at the beginning but you know repeated interaction and especially if you have multiple of these agents repeated interaction and then the ability to, to learn from every interaction. So every interaction you dynamically update your inventory, you become better and better over time, or at least these agents become better and better over time. Uh, and, and getting that to scale to, to like more broad coverage success is really a matter of how can we make these interactions, uh, how can we scale them instead of the programmer thinking what would be good interactions. So one possible way would be uh, if we could, you know, rather than just looking at a corpus of sentences, um, we try to try to find corpuses of of dialogue, and try to figure out what are the recurrent structures in dialogue, and to automatically extract the kind of you know interactions that people engage in, and and that way I I see this scaling up to uh, successful interactions across the board. Wow. So the the key really doesn't maybe the key doesn't lie in anything specific it's just about having interactions and the more interactions the better yes and because i think one thing about language is that um, you recruit or that's how i like to look at it when you use language you recruit everything like your social knowledge your experience your linguistic knowledge uh, you know a lot about the person that you're talking to and we're very good at immediately seeing uh, you know, how to adapt. You know, is this a more senior person? Is this a foreign language user? Is this a child that we're talking to? And, and then we instantly adapt uh, the way we speak. Um, so it's, there's, there's, not a, there's not one key. It's, it's a whole set of things. And I, I do believe that in order to make languages function, you, you really need a lot. You know, the, the complex, the, the cognitive machinery you need for it, it's, it's, uh, it's a lot. But just like any kind of you know, cognitively challenging task, you need a lot of uh, cognitive, uh, let's say, functions if you want. I don't believe that there is one key mechanism that, that does a trick for everything. Yeah, no. And, um, well, I, I don't know if, if any of your work has sort of looked at um, the differences between um, child and adult learning. But um, there, there seems it, it, it's one of those fascinating things. It's like if you put an adult and a child together, then the adult will perform better in every cognitive task, basically. But yet children are um, always so much more successful at, at language learning. Um, yes. And, you know, it's, it's probably, well, I mean, 
I know it's an open question in the world of, of linguistics, but my, my pet theory is that it's simply just because of the situation that children are in. You know, they can't, they can't communicate in any other way. Like you say, they don't have any experience in the world, no knowledge. And, um, and also they're, they're in, you know, education, right? They're being forced to learn. Right. Do you have any thoughts about that? Yes. Yes. Um, I think, I think, uh, as we grow older and as we, uh, you know, learn the languages that we learn, we, co we become specialists in these languages. And if you look at the enormous diversity that we have across languages, you cannot come up with one general learning mechanism that say, you know, now I can learn a language. I think a lot of language learning is um, learning the strategies of your language. And then you become more attentive to these things. It's like if, you know, a typical, often people joke of Japanese people that they don't distinguish the L and the R. R sound. Right? They often call me Lemi instead of Remy. Um, and that's, I'm, I'm convinced. So that's because you're not used to distinguish, di distinguishing these sounds because in Japanese they don't make a difference. Uh, you know, it's not used to distinguish different sounds from each other. And just like you, you can become a bit, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not a distinction you pay attention to. Just like in, in sounds, you, you don't, you learn to distinguish only certain categories and you ignore the rest because it's not relevant for you. You can also become like grammatically deaf or blind for certain distinguish, uh, distinctions that um, some languages make. So you learn how to make the distinctions and it's relevant for you for communication. But uh, you know, other distinctions that other languages make are not relevant for you. And so you, you have a hard time, uh, you know, hearing, even just observing these distinctions. So I think it's, it's just like you become specialized in your language. And because you're so good at these strategies, I think it's, it's harder than to, you know, to forget about these habits and these strategies when you learn another language. Uh, and I think this is one part why children who haven't developed this specialization yet they still have to explore the whole learning space. Why they are better at picking up a new language than, than adults would be. Yeah, I mean that does explain, like for example, why you know adults adults can can be pretty good at picking up grammar, but there are very very few adults who will ever sound sound like a native speaker, right? Yeah, my French is an example of that. So I, <laughs> after almost 15 years in France, uh, you know, I still stand out. I just have to say bonjour to people. And they say, oh, here is the guide for English speakers. Or <laughs> <laughs> I know it's, it's actually, I think that's, that's something that a lot of people who are learning a second language or a third language, that's the worst experience. After only one word, the person knows. Uh, you know, you're a foreigner. I'm gonna, I'm gonna speak to you in English or, or whatever. Yeah, right. <laughs> it makes you feel it's totally demotivating. Um, so, so yeah, I, I wanted to talk specifically about some of your work, and and so I have this paper here. Uh, how construction grammar, how a construction grammar account solves the auxiliary controversy, yeah. and so well, it says here that. Um, English auxiliaries have been a matter of dispute for decades with two opposing views. One is that their, their auxiliaries are like the main verbs, which take a complement, and the other one is that um, they are sort of, well, auxiliaries, they're helpers, uh, right? And, but, so how does construction grammar solve this, this problem? Well, in a construction, because everything is a construction, um, you, you can model whatever you want, right? So you don't... You don't have to make a choice between either. It's, it's hard to not become a bit technical about these things, but um, like typically those, those analyses that um, treat auxiliaries as um, you know heads that take complements, they start from a particular representation of linguistic structure. It's a, basically a tree representation, and then a particular grammar that you need for describing those trees. Now. Um, People who know me know that I think that a tree is, is an awful way to, to describe the structure of language uh, because it's just a two-dimensional uh, representation device. And languages are much more complex than that. So 
what you get is so you have your tree structure and now and that kind of becomes your backbone for everything and now all of the information about language you have to fit onto this tree somehow right so even if it's completely different in in terms of uh, information you still have to fit it onto a tree so you have these auxiliaries for example and what we know in english is that the presence of an auxiliary is going to have an effect on what what else is present in the let's call it a verb phrase and so how do you model that well if you assume that language consists of one hand a lexicon and the other hand just syntactic rules that combine these things you have to put those constraints onto the auxiliary directly and so then you're obliged to say that your auxiliary is the head um, and then and then you build your tree in that way and so that's I think it's a fine solution for trying to then impose certain constraints on the rest of the verb phrase. Now, when you when you read then linguists who do field work, mostly traditional linguists actually, um, they say it doesn't really fit the data. Uh, the English auxiliary system also it, it's not as clean cut as it as it seems. It, you know, there's lots of variation. Things are still moving. You know, a language is a very dynamic system, um, and so. It's, it would be more natural to say that it's, it's just helper, um, it's just helper words. Because if, if all of the auxiliaries are, let's say, heads of a phrase, then if you want to say something, he will have been singing, you have a, you know, a complex clause of uh, one, two, three, four, four clauses into one structure. So it doesn't seem to, seem to be what, what, um, um, what, what humans are, are doing is like it's, doesn't necessarily make it syntactically more complex for them. Now the problem with the other solution is um, is that it's harder technically representation wise than to impose the constraints on other parts of the sentence. So what a construction grammar allows you to do is is to say well we don't need uh, we don't need the kind of formal restrictions of the one account. But we do know how to model the, uh, uh, the, the, the things that, you, that are hard to model in the more functional account by, for example, saying the auxiliary can bring something to the table, but there is this overarching construction which also carries meaning. And I think one, one example when we talk about auxiliaries is the progressive construction. So I was walking or I am walking, right? So the ing form. And typically you have a copula B um, and then you have the ing form. And we, we use that to express duration or like an ongoing activity. Now, I think what's interesting is that you, you, you kind of have this double verb construction in English where you can replace the verb to be with almost any verb to modify, let's say, the aspect of the second verb. If you would say, I started singing, or I started walking, and all of a sudden this construction takes the semantics of this verb start, and it's going to use start as if it's an auxiliary, because you're modifying the part of the event structure of singing and walking to only focus or emphasize the beginning of that event, right? Or I finished singing. Now all of a sudden I take, I take the semantics of finishing, I use it as an auxiliary to focus on the end of the, cement, the, the event structure, if you want, of this activity. So whereas I'm using to be often as, as a way to, uh, to, to look at something it's ongoing, I am singing, there's no beginning, there's no end, we're just focusing on the process, I can just plug in any other verb. And then, again, ch change what I'm focusing on in the event structure of the other verb. So that suggests that something some part of the meaning is not coming from the auxiliary there is some bigger construction that knows how to take the semantics of in this case the helper verb and then modulate the meaning of of the main verb if we if we can use that word as so that's something you don't do in you cannot do with a lexical versus syntactic structures because then you need to you know, if you say I started singing, then you need to say, oh, start is maybe also a, uh, a progressive auxiliary in some way. And you add that to your lexicon. No, it's, it's a double object. 
it's a double verb construction. And the first one modulates the, let's say the aspectual information of the second word. And that is something you can do in a construction grammar like very easily. And I don't see how you could do it in another way. Yeah, it's, it's actually fascinating to, to hear those explanations because, um, you know, as a teacher, um, I've, I've kind of found um, hacks to explain certain things like modal auxiliaries in English, like the difference between can and could. And because if, if you were to, to look at them the way that they work, really, there's no kind of there's no good logic there, you know. Um, and, and every time you, you seem to sort of find this logic, there's an exception and it just becomes a total nightmare for, for students. And, and so I've sort of found this, this hack that, that sort of works, but you know, I understand that it's, it's exactly that. And it doesn't actually explain in a satisfying way why this works. But, but, but I see that by actually looking at, at a kind of looking at the thing as a whole, right, as a construction, it, it removes all of that need for defining such specific rules for each piece of grammar. Yes, and, and, and you know, learning these patterns productively as chunks is, is speeding up, is helping to, use, to speed up your proficiency a lot. Even, even you don't really need to understand the syntactic details about everything. Yeah, the verb phrase is, is especially the English verb phrase, is a very rich domain. Um, uh, and, and for the modals, for example, another interesting question is, is how do you explain, for example, future in English? Because English doesn't really have a grammatical future tense, right? And, and then if, if, you, if you start by looking at, let's say, what is, what is the language doing? If you think that syntax is something you need to learn just like that, it doesn't make sense. It, for me, it doesn't make sense. It's like, what, one thing that many people seem to forget is that language is an inferential code. It's like, you know, not all of the meaning is in the message. It's, it's just a series of hints. And you, as a language user, you have to know the code. You have to know, appreciate your social surroundings. And then you can interpret that code. But the meaning only comes once you interpret these things. So if, if you then ask yourself, what are you trying to encode in, in the English verb phrase? And um, so, and then you, you get into questions of how, how do people or English speakers conceptualize the world around them? And so rather than if there is a, there's a let's say conceptually speaking there's a difference between future and present and past you can kind of say that the present is something we experience now the past is something even though our memories are not you know reliable we feel that we know the past but the future is like a possibility it's a possible world if you want and so um the, the way i understand the english will uh, for example it's not as a future marker, but as a possible world. And then the modal auxiliaries are kind of ways to express uh, your relation between the present and that possible world. So if I say, I will, uh, I will go to the supermarket tomorrow, then I'm expressing a possibility in the future, but with you know, good confidence. Um, whereas if I would say, I might go to the supermarket, that possible world still exists, but the relation to, to now is more like, well, you know, I'm not going to commit myself too much to it. So it, it's about that. It's, it's, there is no future. There is possible worlds. And then you have these different models that express your relation to that possible, uh, to that possibility in a sense. What, what, one thing that I, from reading your work, one sort of question that came up in my mind is how does construction grammar sort of, take into account things like culture when, when, when talking about language evolution. So yes, so clarification for many people is that when I talk about language evolution, I talk about the cultural processes, um, meaning that uh, we have, when, we, when we use language, there is processes that create variation. So every time you use language, you know, your pronunciation is a bit different. Uh, there might be some innovation needed. So 
you, you automatically create variation. And then you have processes that select from those variants the ones that you know, become conventionalized in a language. So that's an evolutionary process. Now, construction grammar, or most construction grammarians, um, take this cultural viewpoint that, you know, let's, let's not assume that all of these uh, structures are due to some innate language um, structures, like uh, universal grammar or something like that. Let's assume that we have general cognitive learning mechanisms and that uh, the structures that we see in languages, they are, you know, they are part of these applying these general cognitive learning mechanisms and then uh, specializing them to language. Um, so, so, so that's how construction grammar, most people in construction grammar will look at, at this problem of, of language learning. It's a cultural process. So trying to, to separate um, the, the, the evolution of language and culture is, is basically impossible from, from your point of view. It's impossible. I mean, the, the heart of construction grammar is that all of our linguistic knowledge is, is conventionalized. And conventions are something that you agree upon as a society or as a culture. This is not a conscious process, right? It's as much as the Académie Française, for example, tries to regulate the French language, French will you know, evolve automatically and spontaneously. And the best way you can actually compare that is, is to look at complex adaptive systems in, in nature. So a very simple example is, is an ant path. If an ant finds a food source, they spontaneously form a path to that food source without, without one of the ants being some, some kind of engineer or an architect. It's just a local interaction. So one ant starts spreading out pheromones the other copies that behavior and then somehow they a global structure forms that spontaneously emerges without one of the ants needing to des design that. And languages similarly, it's not designed by one person. There are obviously languages that have been invented, like Esperanto and things like that. But natural languages, they don't get designed by one person. It's the ultimate democratic process. Everyone can contribute something. It might not be picked up by the others, or it might be very successful, and then it propagates in a population and becomes a new convention. Um, and and trying to uh, trying to to look at linguistic structures without looking at why they are used and in which situations that just doesn't make sense to me. Uh, great explanation. Great explanation. Um, and, and actually, just just one one final piece of your work was uh, was this paper. It's a I know it's a little bit older. Um, how intrinsic motivation can speed up language emergence. And, and again, so you modeled this was not with real learners. This was uh, artificial, you know, uh, artificially modeled learners. Yeah. And and so how uh, could you talk about how intrinsic motivation the effect it had yes so intrinsic motivation uh there's many ways or many psychologists have talked about that there's one particular psychologist that influenced us a lot <laughs> unfortunately he has a very difficult name to pronounce it's uh, uh mihai uh chiksent mihai and he has developed this theory of flow and flow means that uh you know a lot of the most activities that give you the most satisfaction in life are not the ones that give you instant gratification or the, the things that turn out to be very difficult, like uh, mountain climbing or raising children. You know, it's very difficult, but afterwards you can have you know, intense grat gratification. Of it. So he developed a theory of flow. And flow means that if you, if you look at a particular challenge, like mountain climbing, then some challenges will be too hard for your current skill set, meaning that um, you get frustrated. So if you immediately go to Mount Everest, you know, that's not a good idea. You will not have a good time. Uh, but on the other hand, if, if, you, you know, if you develop certain skills, then, then uh, a challenge can become boring if it's too easy for you. And so flow is that balance that you have between a challenge that is difficult, but not so difficult that it gets frustrating and uh, not too easy either. So you, you won't get bored. And good teachers actually are very good at, at you know, challenging their students at, you know, to give them challenges adapted to their skill level. Now, 
we uh, we came up with with ways to to model intrinsic motivation according to this idea of flow. Uh, applied we applied it to uh, you know, embodiment of robots. So I had colleagues who are now uh, you know, Pierre Ivoudier who's working in Bordeaux. They applied it to, for example, learning a robot to walk. Um, we have applied it to, to music generation, um, and we have also applied it to language learning. So. What you need is, is some kind of meta level um, where a language user, we call them agents, they have to engage in these tasks. So they are learning a language, um, but at the same time, they are making a prediction about how good they are at this particular task. And this in the beginning can be, a, I know the word for, for something. And if it turns out that the prediction uh, is correct. So, so let's say I have to say a word and I think I know the answer. So my prediction is I'm going to have success in this exercise or this uh, communication. Um, if I'm always right in my prediction, that means that, uh, you know, the exercise is too boring for me. So uh, I want to move to something else. And that's when our agents in an autonomous way decide to, to increase their challenge. So when we put them in a complex world, for example, and in the beginning they will just talk, you know, using one word utterances about uh, objects that they see. And once they get bored with that, because they know every time uh, they talk about objects using single words, uh, their predictions are correct. Then they move on to something that's more challenging, which is like, uh, let's now try and combine two words uh, to talk about objects. And this creates then maybe a moment of frustration and they might retreat uh, to an earlier strategy, but eventually they will get there and then, you know, they will bootstrap their own, uh, let's say, they will decide themselves when it's time to learn something more difficult because because they get bored with what they've been doing or they get artificially bored in a sense. And, and intrinsic motivation, uh, it's, it's a cliche, but that's, it's, it's really, uh, if you want to learn something complex, like learning a language, if you're not motivated, you're not going to get there. Um, so motivation can come from exterior uh, motives, like, uh, like a girlfriend, yes, like a girlfriend. So, you know, it's, there's a good reason to communicate. Uh, but the best way to learn something is, is you want to. And, and if you if you want to, then then you're constantly you're you're curious. You know your curiosity is curiosity driven learning, uh, and that's what we wanted to do with that paper. Because because what happens to the agents, you know, um, if if they try to do something that's that's too hard? But, I mean, because obviously in a simulation they can't give up, can they? No, they can't give up. But they just their communication fails. And failure, failure is the key to their learning, is when they fail, they will, they will try to make uh, an adapt adaptation to their knowledge in a way that they can increase their success for the next uh, interaction. Now, our agents, because they're virtual, they, they have to do what I say. They will never give up. Right? They will only give up if I shut down the computer. But, uh, but I, that's, that's, that's how you do it. It's, failure is not a they don't get demotivated. That's a big difference with humans. Humans might get demotivated when they fail, but the failure is a key part of the process. Hmm. Wow, fascinating. Um, well, just to, just, just to finish up, um, I'm just, because I, I ask everybody this, so I'm curious as to like why it is that you have devoted so much of your life to, to language. Um, like what, why do you think that language is, is important? <laughs> there is a, there is a there's a silly answer and there's a more profound answer the silly answer is uh, a lot of people in academics they they choose a, a, a topic at which they're not very good so the cliche is like a, a roboticist who uh, builds robot because he's awkward in movement a psychologist who studies psychology because they you know they they find themselves weird and and I've always been a very introverted person, much less now than before. But as a young person, I, it was hard for me to, to engage with people that I didn't know very well. And so, but it still had always intrigued me language. So that's the, the silly, the silly reason. Uh, 
uh, like trying to, if something, if I don't understand something, then you know, I, I need to, I have this need to, to try and, and, and figure this out. But the more profound, um, the more profound uh, reason is that I think language, I consider language as a technology. It's, it's an instrument that we developed and it's the most brilliant invention that, that human societies have come up with. It is at the same time a way, a window into how we view the world. Uh, it's also a way to do a social bonding. Um, and I think everything uh, that is important to human experience ultimately involves language in some way. So that's why. Romy Van Trape, thank you very much for talking to me today. Thank you. Thank you.